Hi guys. It is a spectacularly gorgeous, and I do mean over the top beautiful, day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization now on this lovely 79 degree December day. That would be Wednesday, December 7th, 2021, I believe. The little dog and I, we have just spent five and a half hours going to get a set of used tires for my gas sucking truck. But now that we are back, uh, <laughs> back to reality in the solitude of the Point Lonesome Swamp, uh, I can finally turn my attention to chronicling the collapse of a planet as if looking out my windshield for the past five hours has not been enough of a chronicle of the downfall of a planet. And I, not surprisingly, I noticed that several of my Alert Tribes members uh, have sent me a story from the mainstream media that I noticed myself about how our favorite billionaire and father of six, Elon Musk, claiming that we need to have more children to save global industrial civilization. Yes, uh, <laughs> he is. Uh, Elon Musk is saying, not enough. There are not enough humans on the planet. And how I think he was complaining how some people, even some smart people, claiming there's too many humans on the planet. But no, the father of six is correcting us. There, we need more people on the planet uh, or we are going to lose global industrial civilization and all I can say is uh, Elon I I hope for the first time in your life you are correct and uh, <laughs> and that the global industrial civilization is on its way out but uh, other than that humorous aside uh, I don't know, are squirrelies on their way out or not like that? Uh, we're going to go over, you know, I I always enjoy it when my fellow Doomer, Rob Milkarski, sends me his uh, excellent uh, blog called Undenial. I always like to check in with, to see what's on Rob's mind. And uh, this week, Rob is sharing with us, it's, a, uh, it's both a new video and a, a, a follow-up from a fellow that I think I might have had a doomsday sermon before. This is a fellow named Andrew Nikiforek. Yes, he is a... Oops. I know what's happened. I need my second pair of old man glasses. Andrew Nikaforek is a Canadian author and journalist. That's all he says here. Uh, who addressed our overshoot reality a couple of weeks ago at the University of Victoria. So uh, the first half, uh, he so Rob puts the, the link to that video, and I highly suggest you watch the video itself. But uh, in the second half of Rob's, uh, and you should, and so Rob sums up, uh, sums up a lot of what was uh, that Andrew discussed in that video, but then in the second half, uh, Rob just turns it over to uh, Andrew with this article from the TYE. Uh, T -Y -E -E. I, have, uh, I have also read from the TYE, and this is uh, titled Andrew Nikaforic Getting Real about our crises, that is the plural of crisis. Okay, so we're gonna, Rob and now I, 
are going to let uh, Andrew Nikaforic uh, take it from here and explain why. Uh, going to explain why Elon Musk has no clue what he's talking about, unfortunately. All right, take it away, Andrew Nikafork. <clears throat> Two weeks ago, I gave a talk at the University of Victoria arguing that our morally bankrupt civilization is chasing dead ends when it comes to climate change and energy spending. I argued that by focusing on emissions, we have failed to acknowledge economic and population growth as the primary driver of those emissions, along with the unrestrained consumption of natural systems that support all life. I added that people plus affluence plus technology make a deadly algorithm that is now paving our road to collective ruin. And this, of course, is the famous IPAT equation, uh, I think first developed or certainly uh, promulgated by, uh, by Paul Ehrlich is what he's talking about, the famous IPAT equation. As Ronald Wright noted in his book, A Short History of Progress, if you have not read A Short History of Progress, it's this little bitty book, takes about an hour. Uh, you need to uh, read that. As Ronald Wright noted in his book, A Short History of Progress, civilization is a pyramid scheme that depends on cancerous rates of growth. So to that end, up to a point, Ronald Wright agrees with Elon Musk. That is exactly what it is. Civilization is a pyramid scheme that depends on cancerous rates of growth. So if we want to continue this civilization as we know it, we need to keep adding more and more and more people like the father of six billionaire Elon Musk is talking about. Uh, but of course, we have this thing called limits to a cancerous, cancerous growth called death of the host. But I'm getting away into my own sermon here. Getting back to Andrew. <clears throat> I also explained that many so-called green technologies, including renewables, hydrogen, and carbon capture and storage, are not big solutions because they require rare earth minerals and fossil fuels for their production and maintenance, these technologies shift problems around. In addition, these green technologies cannot be scaled up in time to cut emissions or require too much energy to make any difference at all. I also emphasize that our biggest problem, well, one of many of our biggest problems, is a self-augmenting, ever-expanding technosphere, which has but one rule, to grow at any cost and build technological artifacts that efficiently dominate human affairs and the biosphere. The technological imperium consumes energy and materials in order to replace all natural systems with artificial ones dependent on high energy inputs and unmanageable complexity. This technological assault on the biosphere 
and our consciousness has greatly weakened our capacity to pay attention to what matters, let alone how to think. And certainly, Elon Musk is the poster child of that sentence. Uh, <laughs> yes, the result is a highly polarized and anxious society that cannot imagine its own collapse, let alone the hazards of its own destructive thinking. The best response to this constellation of emergencies is to actively shrink the technosphere and radically reduce economic growth and energy spending. Our political class, our political class meaning, of course, people, you know, depending on being voted in to uh, power, those guys, our political class cannot imagine such a conversation. At the same time, communities and families must relocalize their lives, disconnect from the global machine, and actively work to restore degraded ecosystems such as old growth forests. Anyone who expects an easy fix or convenient set of solutions has spent too much time being conditioned by digital machines. Yes, my cheerful talk generated scores of questions. There wasn't time to answer them, so I selected five representative queries submitted <clears throat> to keep this heretical conversation going. So these are like the five top questions he, he received from people listening to the talk that you can uh, hear if you go on the link to Rob's that I'll include it here. Okay, number one, the whole matter of population growth in population tied to consumption is a big problem. Do you think so? Many listeners expressed disquiet. I love that word. Expressed disquiet about population growth being an essential part of the problem. Uh, well, it's beyond essential. It is the number one baseline essential all of the problem. But anyway, uh, so he chose this comment from, uh, from one of his clueless moron listeners. Quote, I am disappointed that once again Malthus has entered the room when the difference between per capita emissions for greenhouse gases between the global north and the global south are significant. Isn't it how we live, not how many of us there are? <clears throat> the real answer to that moronic question is uncomfortable. <coughs> how we live and consume matters just as much as the growing density of our numbers combined with the proliferation of our machines that devour energy on our behalf. Once again, he is talking about the three-headed snake of the IPAT equation. Uh, <clears throat> roads and cell phones all consume energy and materials too. All three demographic issues, population or overpopulation, consumption or overconsumption, and technology, <clears throat> all three are increasing at unsustainable rates and feed each other to propel 
more economic growth, more emissions, and more fragility. The world's current population is 7.9 billion and grows by 80 million people per year. It has slowed down, meaning the birth rate in recent years, because the affluent don't need the energy of children as much as the poor. Even so, civilization will add another billion to the planet every dozen years. Redistributing energy wealth, and along with the, the wealth, the emissions from it, from the rich to the poor will not avert disaster if human populations do not overall decline. Our numbers also reflect a demographic anomaly that began with fossil fuels, a cheap energy source that served as Viagra for the species. Prior to our discovery of fossil fuels, the population of the planet never exceeded 1 billion people. Our excessive numbers are purely a temporary artifact of cheap energy spending and all that it entails, everything from fertilizer to modern medicine. And again, guys, if my battery collapses, you can just go on the link for the rest of this. Okay, how many times do we hear this question at Collapse Chronicles? Isn't capitalism the real threat? Many questions I receive revolved around the nature of capitalism. Here is one uh, representative question. Wouldn't it be more accurate to denounce the capitalist organization of technology rather than technology as such as such, you know, in itself for problems like polarization and fragmentation, close quote. Answer, no, it would not. Technology emphasizes growth and concentrates power regardless of the ideology. Capitalism, like socialism and Communism, otherwise capitalism, socialism, and communism are simply ways to use energy to create technologies that structure society in homogenous ways. Removing capitalism from the equation would not change the totalitarian nature of technology itself, or the ability of technologies to colonize local cultures anywhere, every ideology on earth. Capitalism, socialism, communism, any ism you want to talk about, every ideology on earth to date has used technologies to strengthen their grip on power by enmeshing their citizens in complexity and reducing humanity to a series of efficiencies. All have supported digital infrastructure to monitor and survey their citizens. As the sociologist Jacques Ellul noted long ago, ideologies do not count in the face of technological imperative. Next question, of course, the big question. What comes next? Many listeners asked if, quote, there is a sequel to the energy-rich market economy. I have no crystal ball here, but here is my response. 
there will always be some kind of sequel and it is not written, but there is no replacement for cheap fossil fuels and their density and portability. They made our complex civilization what it is. As fossil fuel resources become ever more expensive and difficult to extract, a reality the media ignores, the rich market economy will experience more volatility, inequality, disruptions, corruption, and inflation. It is rare for any civilization to manage an energy descent without violence, let alone grace. Asked one listener, can you say more about the connection between the technosphere and totalitarian societies? How do you see connections between dictatorships and the technosphere? This is a subject for a much longer essay. The technosphere, by definition, offers only one system of thinking and operating triumph of technique over all endeavors and has been eroding human freedoms for decades. It simply creates dependents or inmates. Social influencers now tell us, tell its residents what to buy and how to behave. As such, the technosphere has become an all-encompassing environment for citizens, whether they be so-called democracies or totalitarian societies. The major difference between the two is simply the degree to which techniques have been applied to give the state more total control over its citizens. In both democratic societies and totalitarian ones, technical elites actively mine their citizens for data so that information can be used to engineer, monitor, and survey the behavior of their anxious and unhappy citizens in the technological society. You cannot live in a, te in a technological society without becoming an abstraction. The Chinese state does not hide its intentions. The West still clings to its illusion of freedom. And... Um, I'm going to skip over uh, the discussion on the technosphere corrupts language. You can go on here to find that yourself. And we're going to end up, of course, like anybody else, with the H word. Uh, hope. Hope is not a pill you take in the morning or a crumb left at the table. All right, so this is Andrew Nikofork on hope. Last but not least, I would say last and very least, many listeners asked, how do we maintain How do we maintain hope in the face of so many <coughs> emergencies, abuses, and appalling political leadership. Typically, they ask, quote, how do you get up in the morning? This frequent question confounds and puzzles me. My humble job as a journalist is not to peddle soft soap 
or cheerlead for ideologies and futurists. My job is not to manufacture hope, let alone consent. I have achieved something small if I can help readers differentiate between what matters and what does not matter and highlight the power implications in between. Yet, in a technological society, most everyone seeks an easy, canned message pointing to a bright future. I cannot, in good conscience, tell anyone, let alone my own children, that the days ahead will be happy or bright ones. To everything there is a season, and our civilization has now, step by step, entered a season of discord and chaos. History moves like life itself in a cycle of birth, life, death, and renewal. I hope I'm pronouncing E-L-L-U-L -L -L here right. Jacques Ellul, who wrote prophetically about the inherent dangers of technological society, also addressed the need for authentic hope because it does not reside in the technosphere. The technosphere, a sterile prison, may promise to design your future with plastic words, but really, but what it really offers is the antithesis of hope. Elul, a radical Christian, wrote deeply uh, much about hope and freedom. He noted that hope never abandons people who care about a place and are rooted outside the technosphere, for they will always know what to do by their real connection to real things. He adds that hope cannot be divorced from the virtues of faith and love like all virtues, they must be quietly lived, not daily signaled. For Elul, hope was a combination of vigilant expectation, prayer and realism. Quote, freedom is the ethical expression of the person who hopes, he once wrote. And uh, closing this uh, sermon, hope is living fully in a place you care about and acting against the abuse of power every day. Hope, in other words, is using every initiative, quote, to restore the possibility of people making their own decisions, close quote. Yes, the, the possibility of people making their own decisions, such as about how to uh, react to certain perceived threats to their health, but we're not going to go there. And, uh, Anyway, now that we have wrapped up, uh, I guess that was almost like a two-day late uh, Sunday sermon. I guess that'll be my Tuesday doomsday sermon. Uh, I'm going to have to get out there and then enjoy my little place in the Point Lonesome Swamp, my little piece of paradise on this gorgeous day in the collapse while I still can and I highly suggest you do the same. Bye guys.